I just ask you do, you, do you really need to be told you're an intelligent audience? I mean, maybe I could do, put up a poster and just leave it up there the whole time, that way you'll know. All right, me, you might forget between now and then. I didn't tell you that, but I, if you need to be told. First John 2.19, people do not lose their salvation. This is what happens. They were not from us. Why? They were not of us. They did not continue with us. Why? They were not of us. They went out. Why? To make manifest that they were not of us. The problem is not that they had, had it and lost it, but that they never had it in the first place. That's, that's, you have to go by that verse. When you look at those passages, you have to go by that. Next. 25? 26? Next. Oh, you got it. Looks the same. First uh, John 3, 6. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. That's a present tense. It's continuously sins. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. So there we have another of the same evidence. It's not that you lost it. You never saw him or knew him in the first place. The saved person, whosoever abideth in him, does not habitually sin, sinneth not. The person who does sin as a lifestyle, whosoever sinneth, has never been saved, hath not seen him, neither known him. People who live a lifestyle of sin were never saved in the first place. They never saw the Lord or knew the Lord. Uh, John 17, 3 says that knowing him is life eternal. By the way, that's present, so eternal life has to start in this lifetime. Because you know him during this lifetime, and that's life eternal. Okay? So, two places that say that, he hasn't dealt with that, he just kind of messed around in a bunch of stuff with it that he does. Twelve. Alright, this is interesting. Um, if you deal with people here, for instance, then if any man's work, and work happens to be peeper, people, the people are going to be burned, he says. It's going to be a little more than that. Um, he shall suffer loss. You know, the people will be burned. It's an interesting way of talking about hell, to be burned. Uh, it's not used anywhere else like that. But he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so is by fire. In other words, if your people that you actually talk to, if they leave, you're going to be saved so as by fire. I'm just telling you what he says. Just know that that's what he says. They're going to be saved, yet so is by fire. So be careful. If anybody that you've talked to and evangelized and tried to show how to be, be saved... If they ever leave, that's going to result in you only being saved so as by fire. So you better be careful about all those people and make sure they all stay, because if they don't, that's what it means. This can't mean what he says it means. It's possible, or that's what you get out of it. It's, it's uh, 201. 201. Okay, holy brethren, we did that one. Go to the next one, 202. Okay, yeah. All right. He, he mentioned this the other night. Talked about John 2, 23 through 25. It informs us that when the Lord Jesus was in Jerusalem at the Passover, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew that all men and needed not that, that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. So the belief, which is eris, by the way, 
It's different than your present tense belief. It's different than your perfect tense belief of verse 23. It's simply intellectual understanding that Christ is able to do miracles and is powerful, which falls short of saving faith. It falls short of saving faith. Yes, we believe there's a faith that does not save. In the following context, we see it with Nicodemus. He had the kind of faith mentioned in 2.23. He knew that Christ was a teacher come from God because no man could do these miracles that he did except God be with him. But he still lacked the new birth. So Christ preached, Whosoever believeth um, the Son in the Son should not perish but have everlasting life to him. Saving faith is looking to God, man, Jesus Christ, who was crucified to provide a perfect and sufficient salvation on the basis of his sin-bearing death. To all who trust him alone, who will experience a radical change of life uh, wrought by the Spirit of God upon placing their faith in him. All who so place their faith in Christ are certain of eternal life. All who are simply convinced he can do miracles as did those mentioned in John 2.23 are not. So that deals with that. And you have a lot of other places. John 40, 50, and 53, you see it with Simon the sorcerer. And you see, you see other places in Scripture actually where people say, says they believe, but they weren't saved. It wasn't saving faith. There's a kind of belief that doesn't save. James 2.19 says the devil believes and trembles. Okay, 193. Okay, Galatians 5, 1 through 4. Okay. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free... And be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. What I said before, and actually I want you quickly to go to 34. 34. This is pet argument number three. Because believers are said to cooperate with God in living their Christian lives, that means they can stop cooperating as a lifestyle, so they've lost their salvation. Go back to 193. I'm just telling you, that's another one of his pet arguments. He does them over and over and over again. And I'm just saying, he's just going to different places, making the same argument. And I'm just... You know, I, I can keep arguing it again and again and again, but he's, it's like we're not listening here. Okay? Be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. That doesn't mean they're going to be entangled again with the yoke of bondage just because he says it. All right? They're going to cooperate with what he says. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he's a debtor due to the whole law. Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, you're fallen from grace. So every man that is circumcised, he is a debtor to the whole law. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. So every man that is circumcised, and whosoever you are justified by the law, are not saved. Redeemed people. They get fooled by the false gospel preached in Galatians 1, 6-9, which is adding to grace, adding one thing to grace, adding, for instance, baptism to grace, is enough. And that circumcision was not something that was bad to do. But adding it to grace, first of all, you become a debtor to the whole law, which you can't do. And then, you're, 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 if those of you that are justified by the law, you think by keeping any laws, even one, like baptism, you're fallen from grace. It's a dangerous thing. Okay, go to 194. Okay, Mr. Halfley said he was on Christ. And then he said, believe on me, which happens to be ice, ace, however you want to pronounce it. It's into. On is not the same thing as into. When he says on, that's the word into. When you believe on Christ, it doesn't mean you're getting up on Christ. He said, I'm on the platform and I fall from it. I'm on Christ, he said. Now he wants to squirm out of it, but Mr. Halfley said he was on Christ. The on Christ position is not in the Bible. Those fallen were never in Christ. It never says they were in Christ. To Christ is not salvation. To, fallen from. See, they didn't get in Christ. Those fallen were never in Christ. Okay, 190, 183 actually, 183. How many sins until we're not righteous? If you're debtor to do the whole law, if you're a debtor to do the whole law, how many sins until you're not righteous, until we fall short of God? In other words, if we had to depend on our works in order to get to heaven, how many sins would it take for us to be no longer eligible? How many? Next, 184. Consider these verses answering the question, For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he's guilty of all. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, for his written curse is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Be therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. I'm just going to say Mr. Hayfley will probably say perfect means complete and try to spin out of that. But perfect means sinless, obviously, in, in the context. Answer, one sin. James 2.10, Galatians 3.10, Matthew 5.48, it takes perfection. You're not going to be able to do that. That's why you have to depend on Christ alone. If you add one law, one work, circumcision, baptism, whatever it is, you become a debtor to do the whole law. 
That's what's dangerous, 24. Okay, I already put those at the top, but just remember the people, let's actually go to 66. 24 and 25 we hit already. Okay, Hebrews 10, he talked about uh, the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified, an unholy thing, and hath done despite unto the spirit of grace. Okay, the word sanctified, every time it's used, does not mean that that person is a saved person. Does not mean that. Does not. Does not. Let's put up chart 205. Okay, Isaiah 13.3, 3, I've commanded my sanctified ones. You know who these people were? The Assyrian army. Was the Assyrian army saved? Sanctified ones. What were they? These are unsaved Assyrians. So that does away with that. And actually somebody down here was nodding. Sanctified always saved. They're going, I go to here. Are they saved? Uh, no nods. All right. Uh, let's go to... 89. Actually, go to 55. I'm sorry. 55. Um, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which is the first begin to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed in us by them that heard him? God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Neglecting salvation is what unbelievers do. This is a warning to unbelievers. Go back to 66. Okay, you look at this back at the end of this passage, but we are not of them which draw back into perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. The categories are somebody who believes is saving the soul and the people that draw back into perdition. The warning is about those that draw back into perdition. It's not a person that's saved. It's not a person that's saved. He points out the word sanctified. That doesn't necessitate that this is a saved person. Okay, we can get into an in-depth thing that would probably take me two hours to talk about sanctification through the Bible, but I showed you an example you would understand that. And there, there were head nods and there were no head nods and there was some confusion. Okay, 89. Okay, the whole thing. He says these physical salvation. That is what it was. The whole point in Jude here is that these are people, it's a warning against apostasy. These are all people that were not saved. Yes, they were saved. They were delivered from Egypt. They should have believed because of that. They should have seen the power of God and gotten saved, but they didn't. That's a warning to that kind of person. I mean, when it says, I, I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, you, we're totally twisting that passage when you say saved out of the land of Egypt is physical salvation. Somehow make that into salvation, spiritual salvation. You're totally twisting it. I don't, they said don't deal with it. I thought I'd better one more time. Okay, 32. Okay, um, we say that people... He said something about that. People will just deal with it. it. Teaches that people who sin characteristically as a lifestyle are saved people. I think he went back to another one of the charts about people sinning, but that's just a pet argument. Just because, you know, people that sin characteristically are not saved people. So you can go to all those lists and say they're saved people. They're not saved people. Okay, 32. Oh, it's 32, okay. Um, 68. 68. Okay, 2 Peter 2. All right. After they escape the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Well, escaping the pollutions of the world and the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is not salvation. Escaping pollutions is not salvation language. These are apostates. They are the same ones in verse 1 that deny the Lord that bought them. Okay. Knowledge of the Lord is not enough to justify or redeem. It's not enough to, it's, it is enough to escape the pollutions of the world. Lots of people try to clean up on the outside. The Pharisees did that. That doesn't save you. Believers will not be overcome. 1 John 5, 1 and 4. Okay, uh, 150. We have eight minutes. 150. Okay, regarding born of God. I mean, he said the whole thing about Satan and all that kind of stuff. He still never showed you any place in Scripture that says that, that we're born of the devil. He said, you're of your father, the devil, but he never said, and you say, well, that's assumed that you're, you're born of the devil because father of the devil. No, you're not. That's not an assumption. There's no assumption there. That's adding to scripture. All right? Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born. That's, that's actually the perfect tense. Born can't be unborn. 
I, I don't, you can go to all sorts of like rigmaroles and argue it in whatever way. Look, this person is a child of the devil, and now they become, they got saved, so they become unborn when they never ever were said to be born. You're, it's just a stretch. It's a, not even a stretch. It's, it's just making something out of smoke, out of nothing. There's nothing there. You're making something out of nothing. What the Bible does say is, is born of God. Perfect tense. Verse 4, whatsoever is born of God, okay, overcometh the world. We know that whosoever is born of God. Every one of these underlined words are the perfect tense. So the, the being born of God is completed at one point in the past. Were the results of that birth ongoing. You can't become unborn. Whatever he wants to say to go into it, the scripture clearly teaches you can't be unborn. You can't be. All right? I, I, didn't, I didn't write this. This is God's word. I'm not making this up. I'm just reading the verses. It's what it says. All the other stuff, born and all that stuff, that is a makeup. All right? Believe me. 206. You'll probably make something up about that because believe me. Don't believe him. Something like that. Whosoever is born, here's the question. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ. He said this. He read this verse. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Okay, Mr. Hafley, do you, do you baptize people who believe that Jesus is the Christ or people who don't believe it? Do you baptize people who believe that Jesus is the Christ or people who don't believe it? If you baptize those who do, are they already born of God or not? All right? Do you baptize people who, are, who believe that Jesus is the Christ? Because it says there that he's born of God. So you'd be saying you're baptizing people that are already born of God. Or do, you not, or do people not believe that Jesus is the Christ that you baptize? I'm interested in that. I'm very interested in that. Okay? Just, just thinking of it right along the lines of, of the questioning that we're doing here and the things that we're thinking about. 99. Spew out of his mouth. He had that up there. He didn't want to park on that one, but he did put it up there. This is not a real person in a real mouth, but speaking of God's distaste for lukewarmness. The people hearing this knew of the warm spring water, that external medicinal purposes was horrible to drink. And the Lord was indicating that this is what he thought of their lack of hotness or coldness. It also isn't as God wants people to be cold. He doesn't. There is no doctrine of God spitting people out here. I've never heard of the position of in the mouth of God. It's a salvation point. You're in his mouth. That that's a, in Christ is in his mouth and he can spit you. This is a brand new thing. No one, no one says this, the spew out of your mouth point. All right? 148 and 149. 148. I wish I could go through all of it. Not everyone that says the born of God stays born of God because God disinherits them. He didn't put the verse up. Did you notice that? He just said it. Well, I'm helping him out here. All right? Disinherited some. We'll put it up for him. He says, if we deny him, he also denies. By the way, he didn't tell you. Deny is present tense. They have to continuously deny. Not deny one time. Deny is in the present tense. Something probably didn't look up, but if a child of the devil can become a child of God, then obviously a child can be, we already dealt with that part of it, but go to the next one, 149. As far as being disinherited. He disinherited unbelieving Israelites who never received him, so they did not enter into the rest. Those who did believe in him did inherit the land. These were all unsaved people. They never got saved. They never lost their salvation. They were never saved. Those who deny him, he also says, this is true, but 2 Timothy 2.12, again, is first class, meaning that these are people who really deny him. Christ deniers, and a believer is not a Christ denier. He, will not, he won't deny Christ, cannot. 2 John 1.9 explains, whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He hath not God. The reason he denies him is not because he, he had him and then he lost him. The reason he denies him is because he doesn't have him. The person proves he never had the Lord in the first place. All right, 76. Okay, talks about uh, national. Uh, actually, we have now covered every reference to the book of life in the Bible. I, I think what this is is Exodus 32 and 33. The book of those alive on earth. This is physical life. This is not talking about the book of life. When he quoted that, he quoted that out of context. I just wanted to point it out to you. He just threw it in there. He figured you wouldn't be paying attention maybe. Um, look at 55. 55. Okay, that's not the right one. 83. Okay. Um, this is all about righteousness in Ezekiel. Is the word righteous, tzaddik, ever used of the unsaved? Yes. Thou also, which is judged thy sisters, bear thine own shame for thy sins that thou hast committed more abominable than they. They are more righteous than thou. 
Yea, be thou confounded also, and bear thy shame, in that thou hast justified thy sisters. These people here, that are called righteous, are actually not saved people. The wicked idolaters in Canaan and the Sodomites are destroyed by God, and their sins are said to be righteous compared to Judah. But Abimelech had not come near her, and he said, Lord, wilt thou slay also a righteous nation? That's the Canaanites. Philistines are also called righteous, because they had not been guilty of adultery with Sarah. Also, I'm just telling you, I'm just reporting. That's all I'm doing. Also, one who wins a case in a court is righteous. Deuteronomy 25, 1. Ishbosheth, who was knowingly fighting God's chosen king David, was called righteous. The leaders of his army, Abner. So, and I could go through all of it, but he, he says, well, look, these are saved people. Just because it says that, and in, in, go to 84. Next. Ezekiel 18, Church of Eternal Security. The wicked man turneth away from his wickedness that he committed, and doth that which is lawful and right. He shall save his soul alive, because he considereth and turneth away from all the, his transgressions that he hath committed. He shall surely live, he shall not die. So there's eternal security in Ezekiel. He shall surely live, he shall not die. Okay, 18. One minute. Okay. Um, that's the wrong one, so we must have gotten something in there. We justified our goal. Go to, go to 19. I think we, we messed up our numbers here. No. Uh, 111. That's what we want. 111. How much time? That's my, that was my fault. Okay. Um, he still hasn't answered this in Romans 8, 29 and 30. Uh, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. Whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. Whoever he justified, he glorified. I think the question here is, are we justified? If we're justified, are we glorified? Those that are justified, are they glorified? Still haven't answered that question. One twelve. Okay, Whoever's, whoever he foreknew, he predestined, whoever he predestined, he called, whoever he justified, he glorified. Everybody that's justified is glorified. 113? Okay, by the way, the people that love God? Gentlemen moderators, Mr. Brandenburg, brothers and sisters in Christ, and ladies and gentlemen. I never felt better or had less to do in my life. <clears throat> but chart number 201, please. Now, Mr. Brandenburg says that, again, we have misused this passage. I want you to know we are the ones that have quoted all of us. All of it. They were, when they were of us, they continued with us. When they changed, they went out from us. They went out, why? Because they were not all of us. Now notice the example. Even he cited John 6. From that time, many of his disciples went back, which shows they were with him, and walked no more, which showed they walked with him. And who are the disciples? They're the disciples who believed on him. And Mr. Ross argues that those who believe as disciples are saved. So yes, Mr. Brandenburg, according to John 6, 66, when they were of us, they stayed with us, they continued with us. But when they were not of us, they went out from us, like John 6, 66 shows. And so yes, I say this intelligent audience over and over, because he acts though, and you don't have the sense to see that. And so that's why I say it. Chart number 53, please. One may argue plausibly that we have here linear action, the habit of sin presented in 1 John 3, 6, as in 1 John 3, 4 and 3, 8, where the idea is plain to the clause, for the devil sins from the beginning. That is, he is a continual sinner. Now in 3, 9, John says of the man who is begotten of God, he cannot go on sinning as a habit like the devil. Why? Because he has begotten of God. He's born of God. The English rendering, he cannot sin, fails to note that it is the present infinitive here and not the aorist. 
John does not say that a child of God is not able to commit a single act of sin, as the aorist infinitive would mean. John is refuting the Gnostic plea that one may lead a life of sin in the body without harm to the soul. That heresy still survives in various ways. Who was the scholar who said that? That was a Baptist scholar, Mr. A.T. Robertson. At any rate, we just passed that from his comments. Chart number 87. No, hold that just a second. I want you all to go to the text of 1 Corinthians 3.15. He's made all kinds of fun about this. Hadn't answered the chart yet. But get your Bible. Now Paul says that we are laborers together with God. And he says in 1 Corinthians 3.10, As a wise master builder, he said, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. I laid the foundation, other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Others build on it. Now what do they build upon that foundation? If any man, verse 12, any man, Paul or anybody, if any man build upon this foundation of Christ, if he builds gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble. Now what's he building on it? He's building these things. Now every man's work shall be made manifest. Not his works, but his work. Now what is the work? Paul said, for example, are ye not my work in the Lord? And what would you build on the foundation except people or saints? <laughs> you, wouldn't, you wouldn't build faithful attendance at church. You wouldn't build adultery or drinking. You'd build people on the foundation. Ye are God's building. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and uh, verse 8 and 9. And so he said he builds saints there. Now, any man's work, ye are my work in the Lord, Paul said. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. Paul said, you are my reward to the Thessalonians. If any man's work shall be burned, that is, the work that he put on the foundation of a building, it's metaphorical, of course. He puts a work, that is, he builds on the foundation. Now, if a part of that building is wood, hay, and stubble, and it's unworthy, proves unworthy, it is burned. There's your apostasy, sir. That's my passion, isn't yours? But you may suffer loss of ones you convert, and that'll be sad. Uh, we baptize people who have, who have gone away and walk no more. And yes, we suffer loss, but we shall be saved. Folks, that's what the, that's what the book teaches. That's what the passage teaches. That's what the passage says. And now you can see it for yourself. And I believe that this chart still needs dealing with and had been dealt with yet. And then he came to chart number 55. He came to Hebrews 3 again. May I stress to you again, and you follow the context all the way through. He said, yes, he admits now, Hebrews 3, he admits now that those are saved ones there, but he said by verse 12, it's all changed. Well, you know, last night, Mr. Annenberg, you were arguing that it was just a fleshly connection. We've got him partway to the truth. Now he's agreeing that Hebrews 3 is saved people. They are holy, not fleshly brethren alone. They are partakers of the heavenly, not earthly, physical calling. And they are the apostle and high priest of our profession. Our profession. The Hebrew writer. Who is their high priest? Christ Jesus, not Aaron. They're saved people. Now, he addresses these saved people. Verse 6, Christ has sent over his own house. Whose house are we? So they are the house of God. Now, just like in the old Bible, harden not your hearts, as in the day of provocation. And then all the way down, then he says to these same people in context, verse 12, take heed brethren, lest there be, what brethren? Holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, whose, whose high priest is Christ Jesus, lest there be in any of you an evil heart. Folks, if they weren't saved, they had the evil heart of unbelief. You ever thought about that? If they weren't saved, Mr. Brandenburg, they had an evil heart of unbelief, you see. But he warns these folks, lest there be in them, in who? Holy brethren, an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. See that? Oh, you can see that, friends. Now, he may not, well, at any rate, you're intelligent enough to see that. <clears throat> and then he came to John 2, chart 190. And he said, well, he said, you know, he said, uh, not everybody there was saved in the book of John. Well, friend, let's just understand this. John, the gospel of John, is not his friend. If his application in John is true, 
Why do other passages contradict his conclusion? Notice the Gospel of John says, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life. You believe not that I am he, you'll die in your sins. If a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. If you don't keep his saying, you shall see death, Mr. Brandenburg. And by the way, right in that same context of 1 John 2, 23 to 25, he mentions his disciples also in the same place. And if, the, if these others, he makes a distinguishing mark between them. And if these others, were, were none of them saved? Were none of them saved? You need to look at that in context. Let's go to Galatians 5, chart number 238. He said, these folks here were never in Christ. I took it down. You heard him say it. These folks here were never in Christ. Folks, how has he answered this argument? Stand free in the, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. Be not entangled again. They have not yet been entangled, but he warns them to be not entangled again. A thing which he says can't happen. Why warn them not to be entangled again if it can't happen? Hmm? He said it hadn't happened yet. Grant that. Why would Paul warn them, though, not to be entangled again if it's impossible to be entangled again? See, you wouldn't say to somebody who was never in Christ, be not entangled again. Christ has become of no effect unto you, showing he had been of some effect. And by the way, chart number 225. These Galatians were saved. Christ died for them. Galatians 1, 6, God called them into the grace of Christ. Justified by faith, not works. They had received the Spirit. They're all one in Christ Jesus. They were to stand fast, be not entangled again, and Christ would become of no effect. Ye are fallen from grace. And then, just three verses after that, he says, of these same folks, ye are fallen from grace. He said, you did run well. He said, they were never in Christ. He said it. Did you, you don't, you won't deny that. He said it, didn't he, folks? He said, biggest life, they were never in Christ. Well, why three verses south of there did he said, you did run well? Now, Mr. Blandenburg, you got some explaining to do. <clears throat> I guess he, he wonders that you all are not very intelligent. He doesn't think you all are intelligent. I'm, I'm trying to tell you, you are intelligent. He, he makes like you, not, you can't see this. He doesn't think you're too intelligent. And then he said, uh, how many sins can a fellow commit? How many sins? Chart 205. Mr. Brandenburg, how many sins did Adam and Eve commit to get out of the garden? How many sins David and Bathsheba were committed? Ananias and Sapphira committed one sin. Yet he said they'll be in heaven. God said all liars will be in hell. This man says, he wants to know how many sins. Does the opponent believe that all the sins a man may commit from my daughter to murder will not make his soul in any more nature? Oh, friend, he said he doesn't believe that. I wonder, I wonder, Mr. Brandenburg, you say these folks don't commit these things uh, characteristically. What if they committed them uncharacteristically? See, what if they committed uncharacteristic, one, one sin? A man's overtaken in a fault. And it's uncharacteristic of him. And how could you restore such an one if he never was saved? And then he came to chart number 245 on uh, sanctified. He said, sanctified doesn't mean saved. Chart 245. All right, now watch it, friends. He says, he that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sorrow, worse punishment, suppose ye, shall he be thought worthy, who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenant, wherewith he was sanctified, and unholy. He said, sanctified doesn't always mean saved. What's it mean right there, folks? You know, my toothbrush is sanctified. Nobody uses my toothbrush. Nobody uses One time a little boy came in and he was brushing the dog's teeth with, with a daddy's toothbrush. His daddy came in and said, Son, what are you doing with daddy's toothbrush? He said, Oh, don't worry, daddy. I, 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 I'll rinse it off. I, I always do. Well, but that, that, that toothbrush is supposed to be sanctified. I understand they used to sanctify it. 
Isaiah 13, 3, I agree. You know, Cornelius was a devout man, not a depraved man. Acts 10, 2, before he received the Spirit, was baptized. We could argue about that. Calls him a devout man. I understand people are called devout in the world. He's a good man, good and honest heart. Here's the word. I understand those uses. But what does it mean here, Mr. Brandenburg? It'll not do for you to go to Isaiah 13. What does it mean here, sir? And by the way, Hebrews chapter 2, 13. He, he says, well, Hebrews, these, these weren't saved. Hebrews was written to the saved, Mr. Brandenburg. 2, 13. Just say, what did I say? All right. They had, their sins were purged, Hebrews 1, 3. They were holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling. And he said of them that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heaven. Let us hold fast our profession. And it called to remembrance the former days in which after you were illuminated, you endured a great fight of affliction. You don't tell me these folks weren't saved. You turn to Hebrews 10. He's arguing Hebrews 10 that these folks were, were never saved. Look at Hebrews 10, 35. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence with that great recompense of reward. For you have need of patience that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. For yet a little while neither shall come, will come, and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. But you can lose your faith and depart in unbelief. The just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back. What do you mean draw back? You couldn't draw back because according to you, never was saved. How could you draw back if you never was saved? Thank you, Mr. Brandenburg. Um, and then he came to Jude again. Jude 5, chart 110, please. The Lord, having saved the people out of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believe not. The unfruitful, the blind, are taken away by the Father and cast forth to wither and be burned. Why is that? Because if you forsake the Lord, he'll turn and do you hurt after you've done you good. Chart 162. Mr. Brandenburg says, well, if you're lost, you're never saved. What passage says so? Will opponent tell us? You know, the Bible says the unbeliever is condemned already. Now watch it. If the unbeliever becomes a believer and is saved, was he never an unbeliever? Mr. Brandenburg says, because they were brought out of Egypt and they failed and needed to get to the promised land, never were saved. No, friends. Were they never saved out of Egypt? In Exodus 14, 30, God saved Israel that day. Five minutes. Ah, Got to keep moving. Number 57. He comes to 2 Peter 2. Now notice, they escaped the pollutions of the world. Through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, this is eternal life that might know thee, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. But he said knowledge doesn't save anybody. He said that last night. But that's what the text says. Now he talks about those that will be again entangled. Why warn us? He said, well, that hadn't happened. Well, what, why warn somebody to be, that they could be again entangled if they never could, if that couldn't happen? Chart number 226. Those in Peter, 2 Peter here were never saved. Well, I wonder, Mr. Brandenburg, hadn't you read that they had like precious faith with Peter? And if they weren't saved, neither was Peter. Cleansed from their old sins, 1-9. Established in the present truth. Some denied the Lord that bought them. And that's bought with the precious blood, 1 Peter 1, 18, 19. They escaped the pollutions. And yes, they were saved people. But they were told to grow, grow into grace and knowledge. And then he talks about born of the devil. Well, go with me to 1 John 3. Everybody get your Bible. 1 John 3. Quench that. Now Mr. Brandenburg, he talks about born of the devil. doesn't say born of the devil. When it says you, you are of your father the devil, what does that mean? But let's go to 1 John 3. Get your book. 1 John 3, 7. Now I want you to watch some parallel. Get your Bible and get your index finger. Verse 7, little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. What about the fellow that committed sin? Watch. He that committed sin is of the devil. Now hold your finger there. Look at verse 8. He that committed sin is of the devil. Now jump down to verse 9. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. Notice the contrast. Verse 8, first line, verse 8. He that committeth sin is of the devil. Verse 9, whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. Three minutes. Now, folks, do you get it? 
The one of the devil is born of the devil, is the thought in 1 John 3, 8, because the parallel opposite the antithesis in verse 9 is, if you're born of God, you do not continue and commit sin. But if you're a child of the devil, born of the devil in other words, then you commit sin. Do you see that parallel in that text? I believe this audience sees it, whether you do or not. Chart number 83. Can one be unborn? No, folks, not physically. Physically, our lives are independent of our parents. They die, we live. But that isn't true spiritually. This life is in His Son. And so if I don't abide in the Son, I don't have the life. Why? Because life is in the Son. 1 John 5, 11. This is the record God has given us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. I can't. I can. And by the way, how could you disinherit a child if he never was a child? Huh, Mr. Bannenberg? He cited Numbers 14, disinheriting. He disinherited his children. Why would you disinherit somebody and never was your child? And he said... Uh, uh, he said, 1 John 5, 1. Get your Bible. Get your Bible. 1 John 5, 1. And he wanted to bring in baptism. I guess they weren't satisfied with last year. You want to repeat last year, Mr. Brandenburg or Mr. Ross, you have an opportunity. If you feel froggy, you can hop on, sir. And here's how we'll deal with you. Turn to 1 John chapter 5. Now here's their reading. He said, whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. He said, now, does the fellow you baptized believe? If he believes, he's born of God. One minute. Okay, Mr. Brandenburg, let me ask you a question. In 1 John 4, 7, 1 John 4, 7, it says, Everyone that loveth is born of God. Everyone that loveth is born of God. Mr. Brandenburg, does the fellow that you say to say the sinner's prayer, Lord Jesus, I receive in my heart as my personal Savior, does he love God or hate God before he prays that prayer? Now, if he loves God, according to you, he's born of God already before he believes. See the parallel? Everyone that loveth is born of God. He said, everyone that believeth is born of God. He said, why, then if you believe before you're baptized, you're born of God before you're baptized. Well, if you love God before you believe, then you're born of God. Or else you have a hater believing in God. You see the parallel there, don't you? 1 John 2, 29, everyone that doeth righteousness is born of God. It takes it all. And first Revelation 3, 16, Jesus said, I will spew thee out. He said it. That's what Jesus said. And then the righteous. Chart number 59, 69. Uh, ah. Ah, okay. I can only deal with what the passages say. I can't deal with the stuff that is made up. But Romans 8, 35 through 39. Um, actually, go back to 111, because we, we were on the, that's the, you got the passage, actually. You know, he talked about these are people that, that actually are those that would love God. Um, it says, who, is, um, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Well, these people we know back from 28 are them to them that love God. So those people that love God, that's who we're talking about. We're not, we're not talking about people that don't love God. We're talking about people that love God. Okay? Save people love God. They can't but love God. Alright? And that's because of God. Who, you know, we love Him because He first loved us. And God never stops loving us. To say that you lost love would be to go against 1 Corinthians 13, which says that love is eternal. Love is eternal. God's love is eternal. Love is of God. These are people that are saved. Okay, now put, go back to, to 1, uh, thirteen. Okay, nothing can separate them from the love of God. Nothing can separate those people that have been foreknown, predestined, called, justified, glorified. Okay, anybody who's justified is glorified. Is there anyone who's justified that is not glorified? Everybody that's justified is glorified. That's a guarantee. 
So if you're justified, you can't lose it. It's, it's an automatic thing. You can nod your head, some are nodding your head, no, I think you can lose justification, but that's not what the text says. And then it goes on to say nothing. Romans 8 is all about eternal security. That's what the whole chapter is about, is that you can't lose it. Nothing can separate from love. Not death, life, angels, principalities, powers, things present, things to come, height, depth, or any other creature. Well, things, uh, things present and things to come include sin. So the list is comprehensive. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. So why doesn't sin do it? Because your sin is under the blood of Christ. Your sin is actually taken care of by the substitutionary death of Jesus Christ. The sin is actually cleansed. Like it says in 1 Corinthians 6.11 where it says, You're washed, you're sanctified, you know, such were you. But now you've been washed. So we're washed. That's why nothing will separate us from the love of God. Go ahead and go to uh, one fifteen. Um, Romans 8, 28-30 is not speaking about individuals, he said earlier, but about a group that is predestinated. No individuals are found here, only a group. If God did predestinate individuals to be saved, then he also predestinated some to be lost. Then these same ones were predestinated not to be called, justified, or glorified. Okay? Um, go to the next one, one sixteen. Romans 8 talks about a group, not individuals is what he'll say. But the, and that's what he said. The pronouns who and whom speak of individuals. Who and whom speak of individuals? One or many of them, not a group. Them that love God are individuals. Them that love God is not a group. Okay? God foreknew them and he predestined them to conform to the image of his son. Individuals walk after the Spirit, not a group. The people that are justified are justified individually, not as a group. We're not justified as a group. We're justified individually. Okay? If, if people are, are predestined to be saved, then they're predestined to be lost. Well, the text says that God predestines those he foreknows to conform to the image of his Son. God predestined that those he would justify would conform to the image of his Son. He did not predestine anyone whom he did not justify or glorify. So God only predestines to conform to the image of his Son. They will conform. That's why they're going to continue to love God. Because he's predestined them to, to do that. Okay? And the if clauses mean that these promises are conditional, he says. And he, and he had circled if and he screamed it. And he screamed if really loud, but if clauses in chapter 8 are first class, therefore they're assumptions of reality. He, and I showed clearly that they are, go to 117. Okay. God's election is corporate in general, not individual in particular, so God didn't choose individuals, but those in Christ would be saved. Go to 118. Um, what about this one? Salute Rufus, chosen in the Lord. Is Rufus a group? Is Rufus a name of a group? Or is that an individual, in your knowledge? He says we're, we're elected corporately. Salute Rufus chosen in the Lord. And his mother and mine. Rufus is chosen individually. Or the elder and the elect lady and her children, whom I love in the truth. She has a separate election, separate from John and all the others that love the truth. So he wasn't saying, I'm not elect. But he, but he said the elect lady. So the lady was elect separately from John and those others. Second John 1 John 1.13, the children of thy elect sister greet thee. The children here, obviously justified, redeemed people, are separate from the sister. The children of thy elect sister, well, the children would also be elect. But she's elect as well. So it's individuals, not a group election. It doesn't, it doesn't read like that. So the people that he called, that he elected, those people are justified, those people are glorified. Everybody that is justified is glorified. So his big answer was, he elects a group. Doesn't, it says he doesn't elect a group, he elects individuals. I'm not trying to be condescending, this is what it says. Okay, go to 203. Okay, hey, John 6, 66. I, I guess I was going to deal with that unless I just made that chart up. Just went, phew, made it. But Christ's sheep will, will follow him, John 10, 27 through 29. These stopped following him because they did not receive his message like Peter and the apostles. Disciples is not a salvation term. It's not a salvation term. It says if you believe in him, you become a disciple. It doesn't say that anywhere. It speaks as someone who's a learner. That's what it means. The, the word is mathetes, which comes from the verb mathetuo, which means to learn. That is committed to learning from someone for a certain period of time. Well, that's the meaning of the word. To learn someone, you must follow, and Christ requires a lifetime of following. They didn't believe in him, so they didn't continue following him. First John 2.19 says that you will continue following him if you believe in him. So, next would go to 143. Oh, 143. Actually... Um, this is to deal with that one. I'll get that now. 
Uh, in 1 John chapter 3, he, he, he talks about the present tense. He mentioned that, that I don't know exactly what point he was trying to make from it, except to show that he knew that already. But a person's born of God at one point in the past. It's, it talks about being born of God. The person that's born of God in 1 John 3, 6. I like the verse. I'm glad he brought that verse in at the last minute here because because it says the person's born of God. And actually, if we can find the text actually for that, that's 143. The text that goes with it would be um, 141. Go back to 141. And then we'll go to 143 after I get there. Okay, whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Um, little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth in the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God is manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God, born of God is perfect tense. So a person's born, and can't, he hasn't dealt with that. He, did, he went through the big conniptions about how that, oh yeah, you can actually lose being born because even though it doesn't ever say it anywhere about say, being born of the devil, I'm going to somehow, you know, twist it into that. It purposely doesn't say it anywhere, but I'm going to somehow, you know, slide it into that by, if you just look just right, you'll see it even though it's not in there. If you'll if you just agree with me because you're part of my crowd and if you don't, you know, bad news. All right? But it's, it, it didn't deal with the actual argument. That is, born of God, perfect tense. Never dealt with it. You can't become unborn. Never dealt with it. You know why you can't deal with it? Because you can't deal with it. He's born of God. He can't become unborn. He, he can go with whatever type of argument he wants to get to show that he can become born. But the words mean you can't. He doth not commit sin. So the person that's born of God doesn't have a lifestyle. He said uncharacteristic. What if they uncharacteristically sin? That was just a... Just messing around. That's all he was doing, was messing around. I said characteristic sin like a lifestyle of sin. I didn't say about, what if he sinned uncharacteristically? I'm talking about sinning as a lifestyle. He's just messing around there. That's all he's doing. You need to know about it, though. Um, one, uh, 201. Actually, go back to 143. I want to go back to 143. I want to get that whole thing there. Um, so according to the second part of verse 6, no one who lives a lifestyle sin was ever a real Christian. He had never known Christ. He had never been born of God. Furthermore, according to the first part of this verse, of those who, who do abide in him, they abideth in him, are born of God, are real Christians. Not one of them lives a lifestyle sin. According to the second part of the verse, no one who lives a lifestyle sin was ever a real Christian. Anyone who lives a lifestyle sin, sin it says, was ever a real Christian. So the person that does all that sinning, they never ever, because that's what the passage says, were ever a real Christian. 1 John 3, 6. Go back to that, 141. I want to show them that again. 141. Okay? Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither know him. They were never a Christian if they have a lifestyle of sin. They were never a Christian if they had a lifestyle of sin. They were never a Christian if they had a lifestyle of sin. Do you have that? Because he's going to come back and try to mess it up. That's what the passage says. Okay? 201. Okay? Holy brethren. He says, I'm glad you got that, Mr. Brandenburg. Okay? Holy brethren, brethren, holy brethren are Jewish believers. I didn't go to, um, um, actually, I think we'll, we're going to actually get there. We'll get, we'll get there you know, a little bit later, but as far as the warning passages go. But I, what I said was, he just misquoted me, or whatever, misrepresented me. He said, he says these are unbelievers. I didn't say that. It was a mixed audience. You have to figure out who he's talking to. That's what I said. He said these are unbelievers. You heard him. I never ever said that. What is that? What is it when somebody does that? I'm sitting over there. I don't get it. I don't get this kind of debate. Where you say, he said that. You heard him. I didn't say that. I said it's a mixed multitude. It's a mixed audience. Some are saved. Some are not saved. They're Jews. They're all Jews. Some are holy brethren. Some are brethren. That's why he differentiates them. I don't like it when somebody does that, but, you know, whatever you want to do about it. 199. Okay? So as you go back through here, the, he's talking to the holy brethren here. The, here he starts going into his warning. I already said it's one of his pet arguments just because it says if. You see, part of the thing is, who is saved and who isn't saved? Some people are deceived. They are deceived by the hardness of their heart. They are deceived. They don't know whether they're saved or not. So this helps us be able to determine these passages whether we're saved or not. Okay? So some of those people needed to think about it. So if we hold fast to confidence, how would you know if you're saved? Well, if you don't hold fast to confidence, then you're not. 
All right? That's why an un a believer, that's why he would say it to them. He says, why would they say it if it's not possible? Well, the reason is because some of them were not saved and they needed to know whether they were saved or not. That's why. 1 John 2.19, 1 John 3.6. You don't lose it. You never had it in the first place. Still has an answer. By the way, he did leave it in his chart. They changed. Where did the word changed come in? In 1 John 2.19. Remember that? He said they changed. Where did change come in? Did you guys, did you guys see changed in there? They changed. That's a put it in to get it out. That's eisegesis. You put it in to get it out. Folks, you know, part of the big problem with this debate is you've got you to you go through the smoke and mirrors to get there. Uh, go next chart, 200. We have eight minutes. 200, it was quick. Okay, brethren, th this is the warning part of it. That's why I put it in different colors. I'm not going to get into all the details, but uh, this is the warning part. The warning uh, w was just like those in the wilderness didn't get saved. They weren't saved, all right? I mean, which contradicts what he was saying before about those people in the wilderness and Jude, which is kind of an interesting thing if you want to put the two together, all right? Then let's go to um, uh, 64. 64. Uh, he, go, he goes here and he says, Oh, so he's saying, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Oh, so that means they were saved. Well, once again, people don't, are, are wondering if they're saved or not. They're not sure whether they're saved or not. So, and he's telling them, don't go back to that Jewishness that you were in before. You need to go to Christ. Stand fast in liberty. Some people are looking over their shoulder. He's telling them, I told you that you're going to cooperate. But when he gets to here, I already mentioned to you that if you be circumcised and that he's become effect, no effect in you, whosoever justified by the law, being those that are justified by the law and those that are circumcised, that's unsaved people. Go to 192, 193. 192 first. Okay, so, so he says, these are all saved people, and look what he's saying about them. But so many of most, so, sure, many of most, or most of the Galatians in the audience were justified or redeemed. But who were these people? Galatians 1, 7 through 9, who are these people? But there be some to trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Those are unsaved people. But though we are an angel from heaven, preaching the gospel, you that which we have preached, and you let him be accursed. Those are unsaved. So they weren't all justified or redeemed. You have to determine that by reading the text, which is what I did. He didn't, he didn't even bring in this right here. He brought in all the other verses, but these are not saved people. Okay? 193. Uh, did that one enough. 195. Okay, I never dealt with this one. We had our numbers messed up. Be not deceived, God is not my for whatsoever. A man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall the flesh reap corruption. That's an unsaved person. But he that soweth to the spirit shall the spirit reap life everlasting. That's a saved person. The law of sowing and reaping is axiomatic. Notice that he says, a man, not you or we. The rule is this. If you sow to the flesh, you reap corruption. If you sow to the spirit, you reap life everlasting. Well, justified people will not sow to the flesh, and they will sow to the spirit. Just like we see in Romans 8 with justified people. Okay? Justified people, that's the way they are. Okay, 66. Five minutes. Okay? He talks about sanctified. They, this, these people were not saved in the wilderness. He says, well, it says they're sanctified. Yeah, the Israelites were sanctified. They were set apart, but they weren't saved. They were sanctified by what? Well, it says the blood of the covenant. Yeah, the Old Testament sprinkling of the blood by Moses. That didn't save anybody. It, it's not the, the, the blood of goats. It's the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us from sin. So these, they were not sanctified in the sense that they were sanctified by the blood of Jesus Christ. They were sanctified in a, in a, in a national uh, way. And that's what it's talking about. He, 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 it's twisting it all the way right there. Okay? When it comes to, okay, 198, 198. Okay, Hebrews, I said this before, Hebrews 2, 3, 4, and 6, and 10 are warning passages for unbelievers. I didn't say that it was all saved people in Hebrews, I said it's a mixed multitude, alright? Those warning passages are for that. John 3, 18, just to deal with that, he had that up there. He that believes in the Son is not condemned, he that believes not is condemned already. Yeah, you're condemned, that doesn't mean you're punished. You're waiting for punishment, but until you get believe, you're condemned. You're waiting for punishment. Condemned isn't punishment, it's to be waiting for punishment. That's a twisting right there. Just to throw it around and twist it. Second Peter, he says, well, they're saved in Second Peter. No, they're warned about the apostates that they tell in chapter 2. And then in chapter 3 of Second Peter, those apostates are called scoffers. Who are they scoffing? They're scoffing the believers, which is why these believers are encouraged in Second Peter. Um, 150. Okay, he never dealt with this. They're born, they're born, they're born. These are all perfect. 95. Okay? John 10. 
My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. So the Lord's sheep, they are his sheep. They're not wolves or anything else, they're sheep. His sheep hear his voice. Verse 5 says that they will not follow a stranger, that they will flee from him. They will. He knows, I'm going to slow down here, he knows his sheep. Matthew 7 says that uh, he never knew you if you were not saved. He never knew you. It doesn't say he, he knew you, then he lost knowing you, and then he started knowing you again. His sheep will follow him. They will follow him. Next one, 96. He presently and continuously gives unto his sheep eternal life. If it is eternal and you lost it, it wouldn't be eternal. He keeps on giving eternal life. His sheep shall never perish. The emphatic never, ume in the Greek, double negative, know not. They will know not ever perish. Perish is the aorist middle verb, making this reflexive. Middle is reflexive, which means that, that he himself will not have anything to do with perishing. He can't cause himself to perish even. He will never perish. He himself will not even cause himself to perish. All right? It's heiress that will never at any point perish. Not now, not in the future. The understanding of they shall never perish, in the light of the Greek words here, is that they shall never perish eternally. Next. Okay? His, his father gave his sheep to him. Gave is the perfect tense. They are a gift that keeps on giving because they've been given at one point and the giving continues on. It's ongoing. The giving can't be undone. Once they're given, they're, they stay that gift. That's what it says. That's, that's, that's the verb. Okay, no man is able to pluck them out of the Father's hand. Okay, no man will pluck them out of the Lord Jesus' hand. Next. See? Any man not plucked from the Son's hand, you are also any man. He talks about you getting outside of Christ. You can't get outside of Christ. You are part of any man. You can't pluck yourself even from the Son's hand. No man shall pluck you from the Father's hand. You are, are not a no man. You are a man. So you're outside of the people that can pl pluck from the Father's hand. So not even you can pluck yourself out. You can't do it. Um, 102. This is what the Bible teaches, is eternal security. Once you're saved, you're always saved. All right? I started this the other day. He hasn't dealt with it. Um, the question is, and actually go to 106. Are all of Jesus' prayers answered? 1 John 5 says that if you pray in his will, he'll answer it. Does Jesus know the Father's will? John 14, 9, Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and you have not known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father, and sayest thou then, show us the Father. All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore I said, so yes, he knows the Father will. Would Jesus pray out of the will of the Father? Would he do that? If Jesus prayed for us to be saved, go back to, to chart 102. Knowing perfect, 102, knowing perfectly the will of God, Jesus prayed in verse 11 for the Father to keep those whom he had given him. He had given him at one point, and they continue to be his gift, okay? He prayed for them. If, it, if he prayed that prayer, and they are God's irrevocable gift, all these places say that they are an irrevocable gift, cannot be removed. That's what the Bible says, you cannot be removed. He said, what if you start sinning a lot? You were never saved, you can't be removed, you're not going to be that way, you'll be chastised, you won't receive gifts, you won't receive rewards, like 1 Corinthians 3, that's the big deal with that, as far as that goes. And he never even mentioned, so saved by fire, by the way, in 1 Corinthians 3, he left that part out, that's the part I dealt with, he didn't deal with it, okay? But, um, and it's also, by the way, a first class conditional, if, that if is, is the understanding of sense in 1 Corinthians 3, but here, Whoever Jesus prays for, whoever he prays for, those people, 